On the evening of September 14, 2015, seven hikers were exploring Keyhole Canyon in Zion's National Park when they were caught in the middle of one of the most dangerous storms in Utah history. We're following breaking news this evening, tracking flash floods and heavy rain in southern Utah. At Zion National Park right now, rangers say there has been a mudslide. Oh my God. We need to get down. Keyhole Canyon is only five miles off Zion Mount Caramel's highway and stretches for 1,200 feet. The Slot Canyon requires three 30-foot rappels in warm clothes as hikers would be swimming through small, cool pools of water that collect year-round in some areas. For the most part, it is a simple canyon to explore. Most people complete the trip in a day as it requires a cheap $15 permit and a quick training class that takes no more than five hours. Canyoneering is a relatively safe activity. While there are some risks such as moving rocks, falls, or bad equipment, there is one risk that rises above all the others in the sport, flash floods. Flooding is the biggest danger in canyoneering. Because for most explorations, once you enter a canyon, you are committed to exiting from the other side. And if you are caught in the canyon during a flash flood, it usually is not a good thing. 20 minutes after seven hikers entered Keyhole Canyon in 2015, a flash flood warning was issued. But it was too late. What occurred that day was widely reported, but poorly understood. This is their story. Zion National Park in Utah is a 232 square mile park that features a variety of landscapes including canyons, plateaus, forests, and rivers. The highlight of the park is an expansive canyon with some areas averaging 2,000 feet deep. The Narrows and the Subway are two areas within the canyon that are popular for hiking, but our focus today is going to be on a particular slot canyon named Keyhole. A slot canyon is typically more narrow than a traditional canyon, as a slot was formed by the wear of water rushing through the rock. It is typically deeper than it is wide, and some of these canyon's greatest risks are what created them. Water. On the morning of September 14th, six members of the Valencia hiking crew would enroll in an introductory course called Keyhole Subway Ground School at the Zion Adventure Company. The group of seven was made up of 51-year-old Gary Favela, a sales rep from Rancho Cucamonga, group leader 55-year-old Don Teichner, who was semi-retired from managing his family's garment dyeing facility in Los Angeles. 59-year-old Muku Reynolds, a special education aide from China. 58-year-old Steve Arthur, a traffic supervisor with the Ventura County Sheriff's Department. And his wife, Linda Arthur. 53-year-old Robin Brum, a hairstylist from Camarillo. And 56-year-old Mark McKenzie, a system operator for Burbank Water and Power. Six of the seven members were a part of the Valencia hiking crew and had organized the meetup. The VHC was a very active group of individuals. Over a dozen members traveled the world together, trekking in places like Machu Picchu and Kilimanjaro. Don Teichner had taken over the group in 2010 and in four years had grown the number of members from 300 to over 1,000. Six of the seven that would be in Zion National Park that day were a part of the VHC, with the seventh, Robin Brum, being a friend of Linda Arthur who had invited her to be a part of the day's activity. All seven members of the group were experienced hikers, but most of them were not technical canyoneers. Only Mark McKenzie, the Burbank utility engineer, had extensive canyoneering experience and was well versed in repelling techniques. While six of the seven were in the canyoneering training course, Mark would obtain a permit for the group to enter Keyhole later that day. Keyhole is a relatively safe canyon and is usually picked over others because it is only a couple of square miles meaning it can be completed fairly quickly. The quick progression from ground school to self-guided canyoneering has played out in Keyhole thousands of times with relatively few incidents. In fact, there had only been two canyoneering deaths in Zion from 2004 to 2014, one from a fall and the other 
from a repelling mistake. Tom Jones, a former Zion Adventure Company guide, would state, We like to say that canyoneering isn't an extreme sport, unless you're not very smart about it. In a way, it's more dangerous than rock climbing, because once you start into a canyon, you're committed to coming out the bottom. Whereas in rock climbing, you have to have some competency to get up high enough to get into trouble. But canyoneering's complicated rope work, chilly swims, and infrequent glimpses of the sky actually make it more similar to spelunking. Canyoneers don wetsuits and harnesses and sometimes even headlamps as they hike, repel, and swim their way through tight spaces. The next part of Tom Jones's quote is important and will come back into play later in this story. The idea is that you do the canyon and you don't leave anything behind. It's based on the notion that unexplored canyons are a scarce resource, and removing all ropes and anchors allows subsequent parties to experience them as a mystery to be solved. It's even considered questionable to post root details on social media. After completing their repelling course, the six friends would join Mark McKenzie. They were all aware of the potential risk of flash floods, as an integral part of the class was discussing those specific situations and what to do. Don Teichner, the group's leader, would call his wife after reaching the campground where they were staying and express some concerns about the weather. He would also tell his wife about the class and how much fun it was. He said that he would love to show her how to repel, but his wife jokingly replied back, As much as I love you, hun. I'm going to take my own class. The only reason Teichner's wife had not joined the group that day was that she had to stay behind for work. They lived in a retirement community in Mesquite, Nevada, about an hour and a half away from Zion National Park. The plan was for Steve, Linda, and Mark to stop over for dinner in the Teichner's home on the drive back to California the next night. The others would join them for brunch the following morning. While Don was speaking with his wife, another member of the group, McKenzie, would text his son at approximately 11.52 a.m. His text would read, Eating lunch, this is my view. Maybe keyhole this afternoon. Mark would attach this photo to his text. Earlier in 2014, McKenzie had spent a week canyoneering with his other son, completing keyhole and a handful of other more difficult slots. After sending the text, McKenzie would open a keyhole guidebook on his phone, along with a weather report that listed Zion as dry. Over the next hour and a half, the group members would be preparing their gear, packing their backpacks, and ensuring they had all their climbing materials for the day. Then at 1.30 p.m., the seven would pack their gear into Techner and Arthur's pickup trucks before beginning a nine-mile drive to a small parking pullout for Keyhole. As they drove, they would look to the sky, but they were only able to see the south and west because the north and east were obscured by the landscape. What they saw was deceiving to the seven, clear skies. But this was only a representation of the next one and a half hours of weather. What the group couldn't see was a giant dark cloud that was passing from southwest to northeast, about 15 miles to the south of where they currently were located. Additionally, another storm was beginning to form to the southwest, a bigger storm that could cause some serious issues. After reaching their parking spot at approximately 1.50 p.m., they would each grab a quick snack as they began unloading their gear and backpacks. They were a short five-minute walk to the drop point into the canyon, and during the drive to the parking spot for Keyhole Canyon, you lose cell service, so there was no way for the group to effectively check the weather after they reached their destination. If they had left just an hour and a half later, they would have never entered the canyon because at 2.22 p.m. the National Weather Service would issue a flash flood warning for the entire region. After finishing their snacks, the group of seven would begin the short trek to Keyhole Canyon before entering the first descent between 3.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. The exact time of their expedition start is unknown, but it has been narrowed down to this hour. Just before their descent, the group would stop and take this picture just outside the canyon. The now infamous photo would be the last time all seven were seen together.
Outside of the cave, three men were preparing to enter the canyon at around 4.15 p.m. One of the men was canyoneering guide Jim Clary, who along with his brother Derek and one of his brother-in-laws had decided to enter Keyhole because of the weather conditions that were expected that day. The three men, along with one more, had been hiking and canyoneering across Zion National Park all weekend and hoped to explore a more difficult route on Monday. But instead, they settled on Keyhole because it could be completed quickly should the weather turn turn bad. When obtaining his permit for the day, the backcountry desk at Zion has a shall issue policy for permits, which means that unless there's an actual flash flood warning in effect, it will give permits to those who want them. Rangers may dissuade people from going, but the responsibility is aimed to fall with visitors with sufficient warnings in the process. This same process would have been true for the Valencia 7. Jim and his brothers had passed both Steve Arthur and Teichner's truck on the way to the canyon. Jim's group had left the parking lot at 3.50 p.m. before hiking to the canyon entrance and then beginning their expedition. The upper portion of the canyon is relatively flat, with only a couple hundred feet of light scrambling. After this section, the slot opens again before the first rappel takes canyoneers down into the dark narrow slot. This is the last location that a group can bail. Meaning, if you go down the first rappel, you must see the expedition through. It was at this location that Jim's group would come across the Valencia 7. This is important, as this means at 4.30 p.m., the group was just entering the first rappel. As Jim's group came in contact with the larger group, they heard a lot of laughing and cheering. The Valencia 7 were having a great time. Five of the seven had already completed the rappel, while Mackenzie and Favela still stood on top. Jim instantly noticed that Mark had his own gear, but it looked like everyone else in the group was renting, meaning he instantly recognized that they had taken a class and were most likely not as experienced. So Jim would ask Mark if they could pass the group, as it was a common courtesy in canyoneering, and Jim didn't want to be stuck behind an inexperienced large group. While passing the seven members, Jim noticed that the Valencia Seven were using a different rappel technique than his group. This would become an important fact later. The three men would quickly pass the happy-go-lucky group and then proceed further down the canyon. During the two groups run-in, the weather was fantastic. To those in the canyon, they had no idea what was to come because the sky was currently a bright blue with little cloud cover. The conditions couldn't have been more perfect for canyoneering. Just 15 miles south of the current group in Keyhole, the conditions were very different. In a small town, families were fighting for their lives against a flash flood. 1.5 inches of rain had fallen in under half an hour, causing the deadliest flash flood in Utah's history at the time. Videos and pictures that you are seeing on the screen right now started to surface of the flood. A flood in which 13 individuals would lose their lives. Good evening. Late today, the death toll climbed near Utah's border with Arizona, where a wall of water with breathtaking speed and power swept away vehicles filled with people, killing at least a dozen. 20 minutes later, the storm would reach Zion National Park. Jim's group of three was approaching the third rappel when everything would change. A clear, close thunderclap peeled over the canyon walls. Jim would instantly urge his brother-in-law to hurry, screaming at him to just go. They quickly hurried down the third rappel as they knew there were only five minutes of canyon left before they were out. Once Jim heard the thunder, his demeanor changed became intense. He was moving as fast as he could because he knew the danger. After Jim finished the third rappel, he was alone. His two other group members had already taken off down the canyon, but he stood and thought at the bottom of the pitch. He knew that if he left his rope up for the group of seven, they could potentially save precious minutes. But this is when he remembered that they were using a different technique than his more advanced one. Jim was afraid that it would confuse them or potentially slow them down, so he would eventually grab onto his rope and pull it down before moving towards the exit of the canyon. It was at this point it started to rain. It was as if a fire hose had been turned on. One second it was calm, the next it was pouring. This was not a calm storm. It was raining hard and everything was coming from the sky, including hail. Jim would later state that it was the quickest switch 
he had ever seen. By the time Jim's group reached the road, the water was already waist deep. It was flowing several hundred cubic feet per second, and it was only 4.45 p.m. They quickly realized the group of seven behind them had no chance to make it out in time. The rain let up just after 5 p.m., and three hours after the Valencia 7 group had set out, a ranger left a note on the trucks in the parking lot. On Tuesday morning, the search would begin. They would not issue any permits to climbers looking to hike in the area, but there were still groups that would be exploring without a permit. Kyle Anderson, a 25-year-old off-duty canyoneering guide, along with two friends, India and Jay Piacitelli, were looking to explore Keyhole Canyon on Tuesday, September 15th. India and Jay had recently gotten married and had honeymooned their way through Utah's national parks. They had no canyoneering experience, but this is why Kyle was with them. They had chosen Keyhole because the day called for some more bad weather, and they knew Keyhole would be safer than some of the other slot canyons in the area. The trio would begin making their way through Keyhole in the early afternoon. The previous day's weather had left a small pool of cool water on the ground of the canyon. The first and second repels would provide no issues, and the expedition was going exactly as planned. But when they reached the third rappel, something was different. There was a rope on the third rappel, already attached. Kyle leaned over the lip and called out, as he expected another group must be ahead of them, but there was no answer. The trio waited, but the rope never moved, and peering over the edge once again, they could make out something submerged in the small pool below. Kyle thought he saw a leg, but knew that that couldn't be true. In fact, the trio had a quick joke, thinking it was not possible. They would wait for 10 to 15 minutes at the top of this pitch, looking for any sign of movement and periodically calling into the canyon below, but there was still nothing. Kyle decided that he would go first, so he latched himself onto the rope and began rappelling down the 30-foot wall into the muddy pool below. As he neared the bottom, Kyle noticed there was a shoe tangled with the rope, so instinctively he reached out and grabbed it, and the next few seconds, his heart would sink. It wasn't just a shoe, it was a body. Kyle flipped the lifeless body over, looking for any sign. He would see a middle-aged male whose skin was cold and pale white. Kyle would yell back up to his friends, there was a body. He had found one of the members of the Valencia 7. By Thursday evening, all seven bodies had been found, some near Keyhole or in it, while others had been found over a mile downstream. The final victim found was Steve Arthur's wife, Linda, who was found five miles downstream. What occurred on September 14, 2015, was widely reported but poorly understood. The simplest slot canyon had produced the worst canyoneering disaster in American history and the worst accident of any kind in Zion's 97 years. What makes this story so tragic is that all seven had loving families and they were capable and aware hikers. They were paying attention to the weather based on cell records and reports found within the trailers of the seven, but the conditions on that day changed faster than they ever had before, and there was little even experienced canyoneers could do. The one thing that doesn't appear to have been a factor is indifference to risk. The Arthur's son, who also worked for the Ventura County Sheriff's Department, would state, my mom was particular very cautious. She would research every damn thing she could think of. That's what shocked us, you know? Like, how the hell does this get past mom, of all people? One thing that is surprising about the disaster was the discovery that beginners could and would be exploring the Slot Canyon on their own with no guide. The reason, as with many park regulations, tradition. No guides were working the canyons in 1919 when Zion was officially protected, so there was no lobby to argue for concessions. In 2007, when the park updated its wilderness management plan, the rangers determined that even though demand for guides existed, there were 3.6 million visitors in 2015, with roughly 60,000 of those obtaining backcountry permits, meaning there simply weren't enough guides available. In a public opinion poll, 82% percent of respondents voted against commercial guiding. Most of the canyons are a revolving door of people, 
so there's plenty of foot traffic should an accident occur in most scenarios. The lack of guides elevates Zion from the industrial tourism that so many other parks have come to rely on. At Zion, there are very few places where rangers will tell you not to do something for your safety. If you want to climb the giant sandstone walls or descend the steep canyons, it's up to you to learn the skills and look out for yourself. People make their own decisions, and many love that about the park. If you made it this far into the video, I want to thank you. This video is a little different from my others, as this story is more detailed and took more time to create. If you enjoyed this story or want to see longer videos like this one, please hit that like and subscribe button. It would mean the world to me. Until next time.